yeah, what we need to do is figure out like, how do I implement that in my life? And I think for a lot of people, spiritually, they they expect that something should happen. It's like, I should feel something or or something like that. And so what I find helpful is like, God, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do breathing prayer. Um, and I'm not going to expect to feel a certain way, which again, parallels totally with like meditation and mindfulness, right? But taking that time to say, this is important to me. It doesn't have to feel any particular way. It's just about me doing the rhythm of it. Yes. And you do find over time that then in the moments when you feel chaotic and overwhelmed, you're like, I can reach for this relationship in a way that maybe I wasn't like as available to me before. 365 days, but I treat every day like it's my last. I'm only concerned with building on the future because I can't change my past. Positive vibes for positive lives. She just giving you that truth and shifting your mind. It's more mental than you realize. It's up to you to take control because this world is cold and negativity gonna take its toll. Now we've been told any day could be your last. I'm embracing every moment and I cherish every laugh, every smile, every hug, every kiss, every touch, every person in my life that I care about and love. But wait, maybe I'm getting too emotional. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain. Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right. So this a moment of clarity. And make sure you always protect your energy. You stay focused and your life gon' be lit. And you are now rocking with Celeste the therapist. Let's go. Hi, so hi, beautiful people. If you've never been in here before, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Celeste. I'm a therapist from Boston. I come on, I talk to people who are doing things to empower the lives of others through sharing their story. And the goal behind this podcast is to help you shift the way you think. So before we get started, I wanted to tell you about two things. So the first thing I want to tell you about is this community that I have created called Shifting the Way You Think. It's a three-month membership-based community designed to move you forward with creating life changes that's going to stick. And the goal behind this is to give you information in small doses. So there's going to be weekly homework, homework assignments, videos uh, sent straight to your phone or email. Uh, every month, there's going to be a live class with questions and answers and some how-to practical steps to guide you along the way. Currently, there are two classes. The first class is Healing the Inner Child. Uh, and the second class is all about love. Uh, both of those classes are really powerful. I believe that a lot of times we tend to look at life from our trauma lens and we find ourselves struggling because of it. Uh, so the class is only uh, available or the open enrollment only happens four times a year. Uh, the reason why it's only four times a year is because it does require a three month commitment. Uh, so there's no ongoing enrollment. So the four times that the enrollment takes place is January, April, July, and September. And these are the two books that we uh, are coming from, uh, depending on which class you decide to take. The first one is Healing the Inner Child. And the second one is called All About Love. Uh, so those are the two that are available for, for you to be a part of. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is the PEP. So for people that are following me, whether you're following me on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, if you are watching me on YouTube, uh, make sure you hit subscribe and like this video. So people that are following me there, if you want to always be up to date and see kind of like what I post, if you follow me on all my mental health pages, you know, I only post things pertaining to mental health. And if you want to get your daily dose of mental health and uh, may not always get to see my content, you can follow me on the PEP. Next uh, ad um, by Romney is gonna tell you like what the PEP is. I want everyone to do me a favor, go to PEP Pager Lite. That's oh, L-I-T-E in Google Play in the app store, PEP Pager Lite. Follow me on the PEP. And I'm gonna tell you why, because I get so many people complaining that they're not getting notifications when I go live or when I post a video or whatever the case is. I decided I would just notify myself. So I created a notification app called the PEP. If you, it's called PEP Pager Lite, L-I-T-E. If you wanna see what a, what a black man's app looks like, go to Google Play or the app store and download it. Follow me on there. And you'll get notifications when I'm going live. You get notifications when I give stuff away. You'll get notifications when I so like uh, post videos. Oh, this is this is my page. If you go there, you can find my page. Yay, yes. Oh. Cool thing about the PEP is text messaging and emails are invasive. That's why people give you fake email addresses. Having the PEP 
it's called a pet pager light because it's just a pager. Literally, you just receive a note, a buzz, and it's like, oh, look, Celeste posted something. Let me see what it is. Takes you directly to the post. And when I'm done with the post, I make my comment or whatever, and I go right back into the app and proceed to see what other notifications I have. Bam, just like that. That's the pep. And that's a free app that's available to anybody if you're a content creator and uh, you're tired of the, uh, the way the algorithm set up or you really want people who follow you to kind of know what's going on. Uh, that's an easy way to do it uh, where it kind of sends them an alert just like a pager. Uh, it's a pretty cool app. So uh, if you go to Pep Pager Light, you can find that. So I'm so excited to bring on my special guest. I'm going to add him to the stream. My name is Crispin Mayfield, and I'm a therapist in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I have a special interest in attachment science and spirituality. Um, I work with couples. Um, I've been working in the realm of ADHD for uh, four and a half years now. Um, but I really love attachment science and connection and relationships um, and all that. And basically, I'm the I'm the the couples therapist at our clinic, so uh, I'm like living in that world. And then, uh, really, like as I as I was studying the the science of relationships, I was like, oh my gosh, this has so many implications about how we relate to God. And that's kind of like whether or not like you, like whatever tradition you grew up in, if you have some like spiritual concept, like that is playing in your brain in the way that you view yourself and the way that you view God um, on the day to day. So. Thank you for that introduction. What is what's in uh, Oregon? I've never been out there. Is it is it worth going out there to visit for a trip? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's really beautiful, yeah. um, which is, yeah, so there's that, it rains all the time. And um, yeah, I guess those are, those are like the two <laughs> things, you know, we, uh, yeah, we had a lot of, when you got to talk it up a little bit more. So I, <laughs> I want to come see you. You got to tell me. A little right. Bit more. <laughs> I lived in Minneapolis for three years and uh, you know, I, I hated the weather there, but I did love the community and I'm going to hate on my hometown, but I love the community in Minneapolis a lot more than here. I'll just say that, <laughs> say that outright. So, well, I'm really happy to have you. So I really want to understand this idea behind attachment science that you bring up uh, just yeah. a little bit about me. Like I grew up in church. Uh, and I feel like uh, the relationship that I was kind of taught to have with God uh, was more done on autopilot, meaning like it was something that uh, you had to do. Right. This was it, it felt more um, it felt more uh, like disciplinary. It didn't feel like anything that was action oriented. Uh, you know, when I look back at uh, the church I grew up in. I remember it thinking like how dead it felt. Mm -hmm. uh, as an adult, I've changed so much into thinking more about my spirituality and my relationship in that way. I'm very action oriented, um, which mm -hmm. feels a little bit different than the way that I grew up. So I'm always like fascinated to talk to people um, that mm -hmm. kind of really um, it, you're in your bag when it comes to your spirituality and, and thinking about this relationship with with God. So tell me a little bit about how that came about. Yeah. So I grew up in, in the church and for me, it was always like my relationship with God was like, God was always like looking down on you, making sure like you're doing the right thing. Uh, God is always disappointed in you. Like you got to try harder. Um, and this idea of like, <laughs> if you behave well, then you're close to God. And if you don't behave well, then you're far. Um, and you know and that the problem with that is that when things go wrong, you know, whether, whatever you're struggling with, you start to think, well, what am I doing wrong? Right. Mm -hmm. doing that right. Mindset? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, yeah, you know, God's in control of everything. And so, uh, yeah, I must be like offending God if things in my life are going poorly. Right. Um, and what's interesting is that there's a lot of psychological literature that shows that, uh, people that have a spirituality and have a relationship with God or, or have a religion that they practice, that can be a really big asset and a really big positive thing in their life towards mental health. Um, and that makes sense. If you have this sense that God is there with you all the time and, and cares about you, 
Um, but then there's this question, like, what if, what if your concept of God is this, uh, being that's always like critiquing you or always like disappointed in you, right? Then it's sort of like that negative self-talk takes on like a divine voice. Um, and so, and that was my experience was like, it wasn't like God was like a, a positive thing in my life. Uh, and I mean, God was in my life and I went to Bible college, I was going to be a pastor. Um, and it really was only in the last few years of reading attachment science that I'm like, oh my gosh, the way that I relate to God is, is dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> and, and the way that I was taught to relate to God. Um, and really what we can look at is like, so just a quick rundown on attachment science. Um, it was in the 1950s that Dr. John Bowlby uh, started to look at orphans and kids that were separated from their parents. And, <laughs> and he's like, hey, uh, when kids are separated from their parents, uh, they get really upset and <laughs> they really like mentally decline in their mental health. Um, and up until that point, it just was thought like uh, kids just need like they need, you know, shelter and they need food. Um, and what he was saying is actually kids need connection. They need connection with a parent. They need someone that is going to be there for them. And they, f they feel attached to their parents. Um, and so then he started looking at what does a secure relationship between a parent and child look like? Um, and then what does an insecure relationship look like? Um, and that has so many implications for mental health um, when we look at that through an attachment lens. Um, and that's what I do with couples is I look at like what, you know, is your relationship secure or insecure? How do we get to that secure place? Um, but then I was looking at, okay, so what does it mean to have a secure relationship with God? So kids that feel secure in their relationship, they know, right? Mom and dad might be upset with me about doing this or that, but I know that like I can still come to them if I need them. I can count on them, right? It's not like, it's not like I'm going to do the wrong thing. And then my, my dad doesn't talk to me for two days, right? That's traumatizing. Um, but but a kid that knows like, I, I don't really need to worry. Like I might screw up sometimes, uh, but, but my parent is always there for me and I can rest and I can relax. Um, but if you grew up in the church where it's like, you got to like, you got to be on your best behavior if you want a connection with God, then that's actually an anxious, uh, ambivalent attachment style where now you're like kind of white knuckling it and you're trying really hard to be good so that God will stay close to you. Just in the same way that like a, a kid that can't really count on their parent, they try to be really good so that mom or dad will love me. Right. And it's, it's heartbreaking to hear that about a kid. And the thing that research has shown is that that attachment figure, that that framework that we have, if we grow up and we and we keep that same concept of God that we've had, we're going to keep that concept. And so that means you can be, you know, 30 years old and still trying really hard to be good to keep God close. The the part about the mental health, uh, that makes a lot of sense. People with depending on the type of relationship they have and with um, faith, you know, positive, their mental health appears to be po more positive, but it depends on the type of relationship because a lot of people uh, will say that, uh, you know, I'll just say Christian, um, but whatever mm -hmm. they are, I, I've, I have clients from all different faiths and a lot of times they know what it says to do. They can repeat it verbatim, but the actual part of applying it to their life doesn't happen. How, how do you think one can work on creating a secure relationship and also thinking about applying like the fundamental principles to their life? Because I don't know if it's always been kind of taught that way when you think about mm -hmm. the way that you and I have talked about our understanding of it. How does mm -hmm. one start to kind of formulate that relationship? Yeah. So I, I'm specifically kind of in the Christian arena, but that being said, I would say most of the world religions, there is a component of, of God being love and God being loving. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that I was in uh, Minneapolis for a while. So I had a lot of Muslim friends cause there's a big Somali community there. Um, and it's Allah the most merciful, you know? And so this kindness um, and so how do we cultivate noticing that love and kindness is, I think, really important. And a lot of old faith traditions have done that. Um, 
And so you think about, uh, I'm thinking about the Christian faith. Uh, there are these, these traditions um, and they can feel like dead traditions uh, sometimes, right? But also they can be this sort of neutral space in which to experience the love of God. And so uh, for some people, what they do is they'll say, um, you know, I'm going to take 10 minutes and I'm just going to meditate on that word love. And I'm going to know that God is with me and God loves me. Um, whereas I grew up where it was like, if you're praying, like it's because you're supposed to hear from God and God is going to tell you what you're supposed to do. And he's going to like convict you for the things you're doing wrong. And, you know, like if you think about like, if that's your only interaction with your heavenly parent, right. Just as, w as when you're a kid, like it doesn't feel good. Right. But when, you know, I have a five-year-old and when he just comes and sits on my lap and he'll do that sometimes, just stare out the window, right? And that is where secure attachment happens. Um, it's called a yield state where it's like, I, there's nothing to do. I'm not being evaluated. There's no goal here. We're just being together. And so when we think about doing that same thing with God, there are some really great spiritual practices like that, where it's like, I don't, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to strive for anything. Um, when we look at like the, the, uh, you know, what Christians would call the old Testament, but the Torah, which the, um, you know, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity descends from like, there's the Sabbath that God institutes and, and God, Yahweh says like, this is what's going to be unique about, about, Israel is that they're going to rest every seventh day. We're going to just have this time to be together. Um, and that actually fits totally with attachment to say, like, we need a place where we can just be present um, and let our minds rest. And, you know, if you've been around mental health very long, you're like, hey, that sounds like mindfulness and meditation. And I think that's basically like, I'm not saying that that is not true, but I, it, there's a reason that these things fit together. And so having that time to just be present. Um, and, and so much of the church tradition can be such a good, like sensory holding environment for that. So, uh, being and being with your community and singing songs together, um, those sorts of things, when you can tie that to, this is what love of, uh, you know, relationship with God is like, then that can be such a positive thing. If it's connected to negative self-talk where you're like criticizing yourself all the time, then that's not so helpful. Yeah, that's really good. The whole mindfulness, everything that I talk about, it actually comes from my, uh, the fundamentals of the way that I've learned, you know, about um, God, because mm -hmm. I took it a step further and decide to apply it to my life. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of um, being still and, um, you know, the mindfulness piece allows mm -hmm. me to renew my mind and my spirit. And so many times I tell people when you're struggling spiritually, uh, and it doesn't have to be about it, any extreme religion, but when you're struggling inside, you got to ask yourself, what are you actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Because a lot of it, the framework on how we live our life tends mm -hmm. to happen internally. So if I'm starting mm -hmm. my day, on social media or um, arguing with somebody about politics or whatever it is, mm -hmm. why wouldn't I feel so upside down inside, right? Mm -hmm. But if I take time to process like the things that have taken place over the day, then I can allow that stuff to be released, right? Mm -hmm. And it, th these are the things that are literally um, in most uh, religions, right? About mm -hmm. the stillness of right. what we don't apply it to our life. <laughs> We just don't. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. I would say even for me, like the pandemic has been a time to be like, you know, this is the time I got to start in. Like I have the time to do the things that I've always said I should be doing. And I think what's great is that if you can find a practice that works for you, where you feel peace, then it's it shifts from like, here's this exercise or whatever I'm supposed to do to like, this is actually a place I can find rest and peace. Mm -hmm. And I mean, going back to that attachment part, part of an attachment figure, that person you feel connected to that parent, that caregiver is they are a refuge for you in a chaotic world. So they're the person that when you need comfort and when you need stillness, you can go back to them and connect. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what we need to do is figure out like, how do I implement that in my life? And I think for a lot of people, spiritually, they, they expect that something should happen. 
It's like, I should feel something or, or something like that. And so what I find helpful is like, God, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do breathing prayer. Um, and I'm not going to expect to feel a certain way, which again, parallels totally with like meditation and mindfulness, right? But taking that time to say, this is important to me. It doesn't have to feel any particular way. It's just about me doing the rhythm of it. Yes. And you do find over time that then in the moments when you feel chaotic and overwhelmed, you're like, I can reach for this relationship in a way that maybe I wasn't like as available to me before. Yes. And it, it's about, you know, the rhythm and the cadence of it, because mm -hmm. eventually your mind and body has no other choice but to fall in line with the things that you're doing. Right. So mm -hmm. initially it may not you may not feel anything. It may feel pointless. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're trying to introduce a new concept. Uh, one of the questions is a really good question is, um, do you do we see people dropping off the traditional religion spectrum? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a it's such a big that's question. question. Yes. My you want me to start or you got this. <laughs> you got this, Chris. But let's well, you got this. <laughs> let, let me tell you uh, what I what I see. I mean, I'm I'm in a particular uh, I, w I was telling Celeste, you know, I have an evangelical background um, and that, you know, word means a lot of things. As long um, as you're not calling angels from Africa, Chris. <laughs> right. Well, and that's the thing is I, I see people, um, I, I would say like the, like the, the Christianity of evangelicalism uh, is white Christian nationalism. And so I think people are seeing that clearer and clearer and like, uh, you know, Trump being elected and Christians identifying with him. I've just seen more and more people be like, I just, I can't do this. Um, you know, I, you I don't. Are you saying that the evangelical uh, is, is related to like, um, related to like white supremacy or it just happens to be that a lot of evangelical Christians are white supremacists. <laughs> well, when I say like white supremacy, I think of uh, particularly like uh, the, like a racialized society. So I don't necessarily mean like uh, KKK, but I mean like um, people like Dave Ramsey uh, would be a great example. He, you know, is an evangelical and he's like, people are poor because uh, they're lazy. And so if there are groups of people in the U.S. that are, that are poor, more poor than others, they must just be lazy um, and that sort of thing. And actually there's this book called Divided by Faith, uh, excellent uh, study in 2000, looking at evangelicals and their belief, whether or not they believe systemic racism exists. Um, and what they found is that um, that w these like kind of tight knit evangelical churches, they all held this like pretty uh, like Republican ide conservative ideology, which meant that they didn't know anyone that had a different experience than them. So they didn't have a frame of reference for like, oh, maybe the world is different than it is for like white middle class men. Right. Um, and then, but it self-perpetuates. And it's actually because they have the strength of their faith and the strength of their community. We could put that in sort of a positive way of like they have had a tight knit community. So they were less likely to like hang out with a coworker because I'm just going to have a barbecue with my Bible study. But then you end up with this really limited view. And, and what it, the study showed was that these white evangelicals were way less um, likely than their other white counterparts to believe in systemic racism. And uh, uh, there's a new book called White Too Long that just came out that kind of like white, up, too, long. white too long. Yeah, uh, that updates that research and, and goes over that. But um but yeah, that's that's really um, and 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 along. I mean, yeah, there, there's there's a lot there. Um, but yeah, I mean, Christianity uh, in the U.S. has always been tied up with like our white supremacist uh, founding. So <laughs> that's a that's a uh, my my wife actually wrote. I mean, there are so many authors. The Cross and the Lynching Tree is one of my favorite. Uh, books on race and Christianity in the U.S. Um, but I will say that my wife wrote a book you called. Say your wife, what? Tell us about your wife. What she do? You got. Yeah. So she wife. she she wrote a book called uh, "The Myth of the American Dream" that came out this last year. Um, it, you know, talking wow, about uh, 
Good. evangelicalism, uh, white evangelicals and how their, uh, the values of Jesus is, uh, you know, he says, you know, I came to poor to came to minister to the poor, the oppressed, uh, those in prison, um, those that are sick. Um, and yet white Christianity in America has, has valued just the opposite, like power, uh, you know, wealth, uh, those sorts of things. So I'll do a little plug for her book, but, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about attachment and faith, but no, we, I gotta have her on now. Cause that yeah. sounds really, it's so interesting yeah. how we, um, you know, claim to be Christian based country, but mm-hmm. the things of, of the Bible are completely not right. Yeah. Are. Yeah. So that's so interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thank you for plugging her. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All that to say, I think that there are a lot of folks, um, it, maybe it's just the people that I know, but but that are like, you know, I like, I grew up, you know, at least giving some benefit to this religion or whatever, you know, consider myself a Christian. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, this specific brand of Christianity that's aligning themselves with Trump. And I don't, I don't want that. Yeah, I'm curious I, for you. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of people uh, um, looking at it differently looking at religion or Christianity differently. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I try, you know, as a therapist, you know, we don't tell people what to believe, but people Mm -hmm. that have been, that are struggling with their faith, I kind of talk to them about their spirituality and Mm -hmm. looking at it more of an individual relationship and kind of the way that you're taught. I don't even, I don't think we understand uh, the mindset that we were brought up in and why we have this such like narrow minded viewpoint on God and how um, we are supposed to be with him. Uh, And so when things are are hard, um, I think we struggle because then it's like, what, you know, what what am I doing wrong? Um, When, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's so much deeper. Um, But it's very, it can be very complicated. But I, I do think in stillness that we can find everything that we need. You know, but I think that uh, with our phones and with work and and everything that we do to not feel, uh, we don't make space for stillness, um, Mm -hmm. which continues to complicate our life. All right. So this is actually a question from the audience. Don't forget, you can find me streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Uh, Go to YouTube, search Celeste the Therapist. You'll be alerted when I go live. All right, let's finish this episode. My mom is an evangelical. I see that she has limited worldview. How do you talk to people who are so extreme like that? Do you have extremists in Oregon? Yes. (laughs) Yes, we do. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if you know much about, yeah, if you, if you know anything about the, 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 I mean, the establishment of, of Oregon, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the question. Um, How do you, talk to people um who are extreme like that i guess the the best thing that that i want to say is uh i want to point you to the work of um uh james hawkins um i believe yeah dr james hawkins uh he's another eft therapist um and he and his colleague are talking about how to have conversations um across the political aisle um doc dr hawkins is black his colleague is white and they're talking about how do we talk about race together um and they're using a therapy model in emotionally focused therapy to like how do we have these conversations um so i'll i'll totally get you a link to some of his stuff and we can put that in there um I don't know if I'm just like passing the buck, but uh, it's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, the only, the, the way, the thing that I've done in my personal life when it comes to the, the evangelicals that I know is I try to find the book that is gonna change their mind a little bit or the movie that's gonna change their mind a little bit. And then, you know, maybe even watch it together. Right. So, you know, can we watch Just Mercy together and talk about talk about the movie? Right. Right. Or can we read this book together and and talk about it as we go? And because I think it's through story that things change. And, you know, we're we're creatures that love story. And 
So, I mean, I think that there's a lot to be said for like setting boundaries and saying like, this isn't, this isn't okay. Or like, this doesn't match up to what you say your faith believes or whatever it is. But what I've also found is at the end, like those things, it just, um, people can't hear it. So it's, I think it's legitimate to say those things, but it's not effective often. Yeah. Um, and they can't hear it because of what you said earlier. When you are only based in your community, you have a very li limited <laughs> view on people that are outside of, you know, right. what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. And um, and another advice I would just kind of give is for people that are struggling with people in their lives that with these extreme viewpoints is remembering that uh, a conversation can't change however old they are years of experience. Uh, mm -hmm. So trying not to uh, get too emotionally involved in it uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's um, it can be draining and taxing, taxing on your mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's important to really remind yourself that, you know, it takes time um, mm -hmm. for people to kind of change. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to add in there. Uh, I have a friend who another therapist, uh, who talks about her name's Connie Baker and she talks about how um, you kind of have to like run the logistics in your head about like, what's the likelihood I'm going to change? Am I going to change this person? How important is this person to me? How much energy is this going to take? You know, am I going to spend, I mean, this is me. Am I going to spend all morning fighting with my wife's great uncle on Facebook and then not be able to be present for my clients in the way that I want to? <laughs> or am I going to be like, you know what, like the, he's going to believe what he's going to believe. And I'm not going to spend to, I'm not going to, I'm going to figure out where can I spend my energy? Yeah. Um, and it's not, I think it's not a question of like, you know, especially I would say like as, as someone of like with certain power and privilege, like I need to be thinking about like, how am I working towards justice? But yeah. am I doing it on Facebook or am I looking at like, <laughs> What are ways in Portland that we can that I can uh, invest in making sure that mental health is more equitable, mm -hmm. you know, and That's I think good. the second one is more important. So. It is Right. It is. I tell people that, you know, social media, is social media and um, mm -hmm. people are doing work outside of social media. And speaking of that, you know, uh, the pandemic happens, you know, mm -hmm. everything gets shut down. But then in the middle of the pandemic, there's this uh, really overt racism that we start to see in mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, because I know you took a break from your podcast around that time. Mm -hmm. um, when you came back on the episode, you kind of talked about uh, you really wanted to kind of focus on um, mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon, right? Right, so yeah. What, what happened in your mind or in your life during this time? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think for one, um, just I wanted to take a break because uh, the, there was just a lot of other things that um, I think that I thought were worth listening to and, and uh, working through. And then, yeah, just personally um, figuring out like what, what that looks like. Um, I'm part of a, I'm part of like the generally white evangelical community in Portland um, and so my wife and I, and my, my wife is uh, an author, um, and speaker. And so we're talking about like, how do we, yeah, what's our role here? Um, and, and how do we, what do we do? So I, one of the things that we did was, um, so, you know, downtown Portland, uh, obviously known for protests. Um, my wife and I went down there a few times and also just tried to figure out like, how do we, yeah, I, I guess one answer was like our EFT community, our therapy, uh, community, we were trying to talk about like, what does equity look like? Um, and for couples therapists, you know, typically we just charge $120 a session cash. Uh, and if that's true, then, you know, who are the clients we're going to be able to see? And if those are the clients that, you know, that can shell out 500 bucks a, a um, month for therapy, like then what's the, if you don't have access to that sort of community for your pool, pool of clients, then who are we going to be able to invite into our EFT community? Mm -hmm. So uh, having conversations like that, um, which was, yeah, our, our EFT community was really proactive, which I appreciated. Um, but then protests um, and then just in the church community um, and how, how for Danielle and I, my wife and I, like, how are we, how do we support leaders of color that are doing things? 
Um, and, and then also like, how can we in our, the community we came from, how can we be a, a voice, I guess, uh, for justice. And so one of the things that we did was we went, uh, downtown and we protested this worship event, uh, by, uh, Sean Foyt. So this, uh, white dude from uh bethel comes in and he's like there are riots in portland but we're gonna bring revival and so um people from the suburbs came in uh to have this worship event um and most people weren't wearing masks <laughs> and and we're like this isn't the way that that justice comes right this is like dr king talks about the negative piece and this is a negative piece here this is like saying like if we just pray and worship like then the riots will go away but you know first of all it wasn't riots and secondly if you're praying for protesters to go away like are you you know but not actually wanting to see the injustice go away. Like, what are you doing here? So my wife and I went down um, and held signs. Mine said like, repent with me of white supremacy. Um, and my wife uh, had a verse that basically uh, is from the Old Testament where God says like, I don't want to hear your noisy songs. Like, I want to see justice roll down, you know, like water. Like, I want to actually see like real change. Um, and then, yeah, going down there and it was like, it's people we knew. It's like people we went to church with that are down there worshiping and we're like holding our signs and, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, and we're just like, this is, you know, talking through with people like this is really pro problematic and this isn't the way that we move forward. But I will say it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's emotionally, uh, taxing. <laughs> and I mean, I'm a white dude, so I don't have to tell that to you. No, like, I know, I know. But you know, it's just, it really is, it's, it's, it's a hard place to live and things find an equilibrium for a while and then something happens and it's like, yeah, you know. So for people listening, it sounds like you've decided to kind of talk to the, your community. And I tell people all the time, the way like we're going to change uh, racism, a lot of it is going to, especially for people that are allies, it's going to be you talking to your community because you they know you best uh and and i think that you know one conversation at a time uh is gonna um help kind of like break up some of that stuff that's going on uh mm -hmm. and and even like within your own family like all of that stuff i think it matters uh it's, and a lot of people like i want what, what can i do i want to do more and i'm like that is a huge start like that mm -hmm. friction that you like to be having this sign and against people that you kind of grew up with or know really well. Um, that's a, I think that's a huge, a huge step into the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like there's, I feel like we're, we want to be a part of the movement in whatever way possible, but mm -hmm. yeah, just recognize that it's, it, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of different pieces to it for yeah. sure. It's not, it's not a one, it's not going to change tomorrow. And I think, it's different parts that have to be done and eventually like things will look better, but it's not happening tomorrow, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So I want you to tell people a little bit about your podcast, uh, because, uh, you are very unique in what you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I want people to kind of, especially people that are really fascinated by this attachment, uh, mm -hmm. science that you talk about, uh, the way that you, you kind of had this awakening or aha moment is pretty fascinating. Uh, so mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty cool. I just learned that just now. Yeah. And I think what's really important, uh, for people in attachment is such a huge, um, topic. Um, and, but one of the, one of the things that's really important to understand about attachment is, uh, there are these specific categories that we operate in relationships. And so um, one tendency we have to do is like, you might be really clingy and you're like, are we okay? Like, I got to make sure we're okay. Like, and they also tend to be really more like demonstrative with emotions, right? Like you're going to know what I'm feeling and and I'm upset and I expect you to be upset too. Um, and that actually comes from this attachment style that likely came from childhood um, then there's this dismissive avoidant attachment style, which is like, what feelings? I don't have any feelings and I don't need other people. And then there's this other way of like, it's both 
where like I'm really worried about the relationship, but I also don't want to share what's going on inside of me. Um, and so I'm kind of caught between like, I want to get close, but I'm afraid of getting close. Um, and so th those are three like main attachment styles. If you want to pick up the book Attached, uh, that talks a lot about dating and attachment styles and how those things play out. Um, so just wanted to do a little plug for like the implications of attachment science. But then we're That's looking... Good. I like yeah, that. we're looking at like, so then what are the ways you relate to God? Do you like, you know, are you really clingy and try really hard to be good? Do you like give kind of a passive, like, I'm going to learn a lot about God, but I'm not going to actually like engage? Um, or am I like worried that God is going to punish me and I'm just kind of wandering around all the time? Like, I kind of want to get close, but I'm afraid that God just really hates my guts. Um all those things can be true. And so we talk about this on the podcast um, and I get a chance to interview people, uh, people that are specialists in the field. And then my friend, Amy, who's a licensed clinical social worker, um, we just kind of uh, shoot the breeze about different topics. Um, and she is fun and brings a lot of energy. Um, like earlier this month, we uh, looked at Frozen the movie. Um, and we just were like, let's talk about the attachment styles that we see here. Um, and we also talk about family system stuff as well. And that's what Amy brings to the podcast. So yeah, we talk about, you know, if here's a healthy family system and we're operating with this idea of God as like a heavenly parent, like what's healthy and what's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you for kind of breaking down that attachment. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people don't even recognize consciously that how they are operating. So just kind of that little two minute thing you just did kind of, <laughs> kind of alerts people a little bit and shakes them up. And like, and whether we're talking right. about their relationship with God or their children or mm -hmm. their history, all of it. Uh, I think that it, it all, um, it, it all matters so that we can start to kind of change. We have to understand what is it that we're working with. And so mm -hmm. many of us are working with a long history of trauma and of, I, I say emotional injury a, a book of adult children of emotionally immature parents, mm -hmm. um, a, a psychologist who wrote it, I can't think of her name, but she talks about this emotional injury. And so when we have mm -hmm. a physical injury, it's easier to remember or to, to say out loud than that right. emotional injury. And I think with the attachment styles, you know, some of them, some of them have caused grave injury to us and mm -hmm. has unfortunately um, shifted the way that we look at life. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's that, I mean, what we're talking about is kind of like the ways that you learn to survive. Did you learn to survive by, you know, if, if, you know, as long as I cling on to mom's like skirt, at least she won't go anywhere and I won't get left. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like, all right, like I know that if I cry or if I'm sad, like I'm just going to, you know, get told, you know, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. So I just had to like push those feelings down. And it's become so automatic now that when my wife's like, what are you feeling? I'm like, I don't know. I don't feel anything. But it was because you had to do that to survive. You had to like stuff those feelings down if yeah. you're going to like make it. So yeah. And I'm so, you see, I have this feelings chart back here. I'm, I'm such a big advocate of people just stopping and, and kind of saying like, how, how are you feeling? And, you know, every time, like when, before we started, I said, how are you feeling today? Uh, and I think that that kind of causes us to pause and it's important uh, so that we're not embodying those feelings. People think like, I don't want to say it out loud because then I'm, it's going to be real, but whether you say it out loud or not, right. it's still happening inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of the message I really want people to kind of understand. Uh, so that mm -hmm. was good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what your podcast sounds amazing. Do you have any books you would recommend about attachment? Yeah. So attached by Amir Levine and Rachel Heller um, is great, especially if you're not if you're not in a committed relationship. That's a really good one. If you are in a committed relationship, "Hold Me Tight" by Sue Johnson is a good one. I would say those are two real basic starts. Um, and then the attachment effect is a third one. And the attachment effect is um, a, just a good overview of attachment, whereas the other two are more self help books. So. Um, Attached, for example, looks at like, you know, what are your automatic things that you do in dating relationships and how do you change that? 
Um, whereas the attachment effect is more like, you know, a, a long Wikipedia article about like, how do we end up with attachment science, which I think is helpful, but depends on what you're going for. That's good. We got a little bit of uh, politics, a little religion and some relationship <laughs> in here. Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> that's, that's what I think is like so important uh, when it comes to mental health is that there's got to be like a, a political component to it, right? So we're, we're, I mean, how we connected initially was around like, if you're stuffing down your feelings all the time, if that's the way you've learned to be in the world, then when you look at someone else's suffering, you ignore that too. And that means that you're less likely to, for example, like if you're a white person, like I don't, I don't want to look at the suffering of people, you know, outside of my circle. Like that doesn't feel good. I can't handle those emotions. Yeah. Um, so then we come up with reasons why it's not true so that we can avoid the emotions. Ah, so. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's why I, I say to people, if you don't get it by now, you really don't want to understand because it would make you too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that makes a lot of sense what you just said around yeah. why people tend to not really want to hear it out mm -hmm. um, because no, I mean, who really, who wants to, who wants right. to uh, put themselves in a position to be uncomfortable? No, mm -hmm. Nobody does. Right. right That's yeah. why we're not outside of racism in general, we don't right. want to feel like anything that causes mm -hmm. us discomfort. So it, it makes right. sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if we have, if we grew up with, a secure attachment where it's like, if I'm sad, if I'm scared, if I'm stressed out, like I can go to my parent and they're going to be there with me. That actually builds that emotional resilience that I don't get so overwhelmed. So I like to think that, you know, people that are like, oh, I don't have any feelings, whatever it is really like, they're just scared inside. They're scared of feeling their feelings, you know? know so, that. which gives me like some empathy yeah, uh, for I them. I'm like, I can't imagine being numb or or saying like, I don't feel, you do feel, you're human, you're not a robot. Right, yeah. And so I'm just like, wow, you're walking through not feeling, that has mm -hmm. to be hard. Right. It has to yeah. be hard because your emotions are going to take over and show up in different aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you <laughs> yeah. see it a lot in relationships. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, yeah, I, early on in my career, I did domestic violence treatment for men and they would say like, oh, women are so emotional. And I'm like, what do you think got you here? <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. See, now we're talking. We're talking about I know we're gonna hit it all. Yeah. No, but it really does have these these implications um, that go forward, and and really a lot of it is like emotional intelligence, right? Like, what am I feeling? And 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 noticing like, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? Um, and when all those things are just automatically going on in the back of our brain, then then we do things that that aren't compassionate or we we end up just trying to survive in these ways that hurt us and hurt others. So, okay. yeah. So pick up a book on attachment today. <laughs> Crispin, this was good. Uh, I appreciate you taking time coming out and um, sharing your wide range of knowledge to my audience. You guys can also check out his website. He has space where you can um, type in your email to get the newsletter. He sends out really mm -hmm. thought, are you writing it or your wife's writing it? Cause it's really well <laughs> I'm, I, I'm writing it. We have, we have different okay. writing styles. We try to collaborate sometimes. It doesn't go well. <laughs> it's really well. It really like shifts me a little bit. I, I enjoy uh, when you put them out. So definitely yeah. um, stay connected with him there. He's active on Twitter and Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to tell the people before you go? I don't think so. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess the one thing I would be remiss to not talk about my other podcast since we got into talking about politics. I do have a podcast with my wife uh, called the Prophetic Imagination Station. And that doesn't have so much to do with uh, psychology, but we we look at uh, media, like evangelical media and from our childhood and we try to understand like, so how, how did we get from like growing up with this to like 81% of our community voting for Trump? So that's kind of our, our thing. So uh, right now we're going through the Chronicles of Narnia and looking at like, you know, what's there and, um, and reviewing that because that was something that we grew up with. But looking now where we're at, like, 
is this something that's still helpful? Is it something we should keep around? So, but it hits on some of the themes we talked about today. So I was like, you know, got to mention that too. Oh. Yeah, and I'll put that in the show notes. And I and I think, you know, with the whole media and film, a lot of the way that we think about life, a lot of it's related to what we kind of were exposed to growing up. So exactly, especially yeah. when it comes to relationships, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that um, so that's good. I'm going to make sure to put that All in right. there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and I love your show. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I just I always you see me like putting it out on Twitter sometimes because I'm just really glad that it exists. So yeah, it's great. Well, thanks so much. You, uh, and tell your wife I'm going to be reaching out to her. Don't hide right. her from me. I do want to uh, talk about that book. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. That'd be great. Bye, Chris Ben. All right. Thank you. Bye. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I uh, connected with him on Twitter and I started following his stuff and I really enjoy it. Uh, he's a really good follow. Uh, so he has two podcasts. Uh, and if you go to his website, crispinmayfield.com, uh, you'll be able to find both. Uh, and then um, if you're listening to this on the audio, uh, you can just click on it in the show notes. If anything we ever say kind of resonates for you, like whether I'm um, whoever I'm talking to in this specific case, uh, we're talking, we talked about different things. Don't just stop here. You know, don't like really start to uh, work on being intentional about your changes. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight that he talked about is this idea of like creating your own rituals and practices, uh, especially if you're somebody that really wants to have a more uh, spiritual connection. Uh, I think that it's important. I, I do believe that uh, um, some of the ways that we may have been brought up have um, kind of um, hindered our growth, uh, especially this attachment style. I mean, this was what, a, like a 45 minute podcast. And, you know, I we've learned so much about attachment. Imagine if we really start to educate ourselves about it the same way we do when our favorite like singer or reality star something happens and then we get so engulfed in it and that's not doing anything for us. So the things that you do find yourself struggling in, like you owe yourself the um, opportunity to understand it better because we have no excuses. We have uh, the media at our fingertips. If you're listening or watching me now, you understand how to work the internet. So definitely like really work on being intentional about looking at um, what you can do to help create changes in your life. So if you are watching me on YouTube, uh, make sure you like and subscribe. If you're watching me on Facebook, share, Periscope, share. Find me on on celestetherapist.com. You can find me there. You can find me on all social media platforms. If you want to uh, be a guest on the show, email me info at celestetherapist.com. And until next time, I'll talk to you. Smile, every hug, every kiss, every touch, every person in my life that I care about and love away. Maybe I'm getting too emotional. Maybe. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Wow. Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain. Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right. So this a moment of clarity. And make sure you always protect your energy. You stay focused and your life gon' be lit. And you are now rocking with Celeste the Therapist.